Hi, I want to say, first of all, thank you. So many uh, kind responses and folks um, jumping in and subscribing and having many kind things to say uh, about this channel and some of, some of the teaching that you are all finding here. And so many questions come up about Rapture and it's, it's very common this time of year, of course, um, because it's, it's kind of, it's one of those high watch seasons. Matthew 24, which is about the Olivet Discourse, stop talking about it as if there's rapture because there's no rapture in there. And that uh, the passage is all entirely about Israel and the second coming. Um, and, and to which I will respond, um, I am in agreement that Matthew 24 um, is predominantly about Israel, but I'm going to say that there are many implications in Matthew 24 as there are in any New Testament passages that might be for Israel, particularly in the gospel. There are implications that are for the church. There are implications in the Old Testament about Israel that are for the church. So sometimes there is subtext that we have to read. Um, I, I want to look at a, a couple of these and, and I'm going to open up the scripture here to Matthew 24, and I'll show you some examples of what I mean. The book of Matthew is arguably um, a book that is has a, as its uh, primary audience Israel. So since Matthew is written to Israel, that doesn't mean there is no church, and that none of the messages, none of the things Jesus is saying is for the church. In fact, Matthew is the only gospel where church is finally mentioned and when you get into uh, Matthew chapter 16. Um, then you finally find church. And um, it's the first place Jesus mentions church. Um, church means assembly. Folks like to show that there is church in the Old Testament because you can find the word assembly. Um, context determines the meaning. Assembly is, is just an assembly. We used to have assemblies in high school. That doesn't mean it's church. It's an assembly. But if you're talking about an assembly and you're talking about a high school and you're talking about an auditorium and the cheerleaders and the football players and all the student body gathered together, then, you know, clearly in the context, we are talking about a high school assembly. But when you're talking about um, a different type of a a church body, a different type of assembly, um, then we have to examine that. And that's a whole other story. There are uh, books, many books that have been written. Paul talks about the mystery of the church, of that assembly. And it was, an, it was um, alluded to frequently in the Old Testament that there would be a time of Gentiles and other sheep and so forth. And Paul talks about the mystery of the church, and he unpacks that a little bit. And so, um, again, context, the context determines the meaning. So um, let's take a look at, at some of these passages here, um, uh, some of these verses here, Matthew 24. Um, and I'll show you a couple of things of what I mean. And then uh, what I really want to address here is, um, is rapture in the Olivet Discourse um, overtly, no, it is not overtly in there. Um, as far as Jesus saying, hey, I'm talking about this thing called rapture here. We, we find rapture, the word harpazo, mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And uh, it is where we get the word rapture from the Latin Bible. Other than that, you're not going to find a lot of overt passages that um, spell it out for you in, in great detail and talks to you and baby talk and says, look, a time's coming in the future, not now. It's the moon, the tribulation's going to happen. So no, there are no verses that say that and that explain it in detail like that. You are hard pressed to find passages in the Bible that talk about um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, these three are all Yahweh, 
And this is how this works. It explains the dynamics of the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. Oh, no. See, there's no Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. So um, there's some things that folks are more willing to accept because we know how to take these different passages of Scripture of the Bible and take the implications of them, put, to, put them together and go one plus one plus one. But hey, that equals three. But yet, in, when we're talking about the Trinity, it's one times one times one is one. We can do that just fine. We can put those things together, except some people don't, right? And we have many cults that start as a result of, of some of that. So there are always going to be misunderstandings, accusations, implications, um, implications of things that aren't there that, that should be, and, and implications of things that aren't there and should never be, but people want to imply them anyway. We have to be careful with the Scripture. And I keep harping on, on this proper exegesis of Scripture and what we use to understand Scripture. And I want to say the first thing, again, is going to be context. What are you talking about in the passage? And authorial intent. What is the author? And, we, and it's part of the context. In this book, who is it written to? What's he trying to communicate? And we see the flow of the passages. Chapters and verses are not inspired. So do we take Matthew 24 and 25 and jam them all together? Yes, they're all part of the Olivet Discourse, except there are so many verses, it's such a long sermon, um, that we can ignore that, that Matthew 25 break and let it all flow together. In fact, even into the first verse or two, into Matthew 26 is all part of the Olivet Discourse. So we take that, we, we look at history, and we look at the culture, and all of that should inform um, how we understand Scripture. We can apply logic um, and, and draw out implications. And by that, um, I'm going to show you exactly what we mean here, because this is kind of what we're doing when we're looking at subtext, and we're looking at logic, and we're looking at the implications in, in the passage and how we can come to some logical conclusions based on this. Matthew chapter 24. Let's take a quick look at this. We can end this book really quickly if this whole book is just about talking about the second coming and he gets to the point about talking about the second coming and then he just calls it done, calls it good. Um, they will deliver you to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. He's speaking about Israel, right? Um, and then... Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Oh, there's a falling away. That's a lot of people will say that that is about, what is that about? Uh, many will fall away. Um, many people will say that's the same thing as, as Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray because lawlessness will be, uh, will, uh, be increased. The love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The end. The end will come. So we're done. We're done with that passage, right? That was the second coming. Then the end will come. Well, no, because then he goes on. And so the end and the second coming are, um, as I like to point out regularly, some 13 times in the passage, Jesus gets to the end, and then the end. Then the end will come. Or... or um, other passages or other ways of wording things about the second coming this then will be the sign of the son of man coming in the clouds that whole kind of thing so the end is mentioned 13 times so we can come to a conclusion what's implied here is that there are many ways jesus is showing how we get to the end and many types of events that jesus is going to lay out in the passage that shows how we get to the end so we know that this is not strictly speaking a linear passage that starts at the beginning with verse one and takes us step by step through the whole process of um, swath of history that he's talking about here. And then we get to the very last verse at the end of chapter 25 or the first verse of chapter 26. And then the end. And then it's done. He doesn't do that. He chooses to tell us about the end in, in many different ways. So that's one type of an implication that um, we can look at here just as an example. Okay. Um, there are more. Let's take a look at a couple more. Oh, well, let's just stay right here. Um, chapter, uh, verse, yeah, verse 15. Um, okay, so when you see the abomination 
of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay. The holy place, the abomination of desolation. You go back to Daniel chapter 9. And there's an implication here. What is it? Raise your hand if you have the answer. What's the implication? The implication is that there's going to be a temple here when this happens, these events. Is there a temple today? No. Well, we know they have plans for a temple, and that is their burning desire to, to see a temple. And um, But these events, one of the things that it does not overtly and expressly say here is that uh, there is a temple and that the temple was destroyed and that it will be rebuilt. We know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and there there has not been a temple since then. So by implication, we see that there's got to be a temple when these events take place. So that's subtext. That's something we can logically conclude. So we can logically conclu conclude that there will be a temple when these events take place and that um, the abomination of desolation, even though some people saw a fulfillment 200 years before Christ, that must have just been a foreshadow when that happened. Um, and, uh, you know, we, have, we saw a time when a statue of Zeus was erected in the temple, when pigs were slaughtered in the temple, and it was, the temple was desecrated a couple hundred years before Christ, not quite 200, but anyway, a couple hundred years close to. Um, but yet Jesus here is saying, when you see it, and so he's talking about it as if it's yet future. So what we can conclude, what's implied here, is that there was a foreshadowing, which happens most of the time with biblical prophecy. This is prophetic writing. And that is that you will see uh, text being explained, and you'll see this in, in Isaiah, text is explained, and all of a sudden, right here in the middle of a verse, all of a sudden the things he's talking about start getting kind of weird, and wait, this never happened back when that was fulfilled. So what we can conclude is that um, it's prophetic language and that there's going to be a future fulfillment that finishes up the passage. Uh, so he's talking about uh, tribulation back earlier, right? He talks about they'll deliver you, deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death and so forth. And then he talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. That's in the middle of Daniel 9.27, right? The 70th week. It mentions the middle of a week, a week of years. And it talks about the abomination of desolation and um, the sacrifices ceasing and all this kind of stuff happening. That's why Jesus is not the fulfillment of that, because Jesus is not the abomination of desolation. Okay, um, Prophecy cease. Um, and then he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that he was speaking of in the form of verses. Um, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Um, some would argue, yeah, that happened in 70 AD. Okay, let's keep reading. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and he will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, there's actually, um, you've got to use lots of symbolic language. You've got to use eisegesis and put that into the text, what is not there. There's nothing here that says symbolically any of that stuff will happen. When Jesus says, I am the door, uh, we know that that's symbolism because he's not literally a door, you know, wood, hinges, doorknob, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, one of the ways that we know, take a look at the Old Testament, look at all the uh, Bible prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus' first coming, all the times the, that um, it was promised that a Messiah was going to come, not in those words necessarily, but anointed one, a seed, what have you. All the promises in the Old Testament concerning Jesus with his first coming, um, the first incarnation. And tell me how many of those Jesus fulfilled symbolically, not actual, literal, physical, symbolically. And if Jesus only fulfilled something symbolically about his first coming, let me know. Post me a note. Um, symbolically, he was born of a virgin. Symbolically born in Bethlehem. Anything symbolically that he fulfilled 
and then show me where he fulfilled it symbolically and not actually. Um, because it's absurd. It's absurd. As if, if it's not fulfilled in a way that's observable by man, then how is that a prophetic sign that's an indicator for us that we can actually follow? See what I mean? Verse 36, he's telling us in another way now, and he's telling us uh, about judgment coming, and he's telling us as in the days of Noah. And, and Luke, it also adds um, Lot. And Lot is, the Lot story is an excellent story that proves the rapture, that implies the rapture. Because why? Um, Lot, the angel told Lot, you got to go. I, I, I cannot nuke this town. I cannot do the things I, I have to do. I cannot destroy this town until you are out. But the point is, is that God would not destroy that town and told him, I can't do it. I can't destroy it until you're out of the way. Same thing as, as we have today. Um, Revelation 3.10, this is a time of trial that is going to come upon the whole world in Revelation 3.10, it says. Um, to try those who dwell upon the earth. You and I are dwelling upon the earth now, right? And we also know that wrath is coming upon the whole world. In Revelation, we see the seal judgments, we see the trumpet judgments, we see the bowl judgments. Interspersed in the middle of all that, we have the three woes. And it's we see this coming upon the whole earth, upon the whole world. And this is the language that we get. Um, is that it's going to be on the whole earth. And this is what we see played out in the book of Revelation from chapter 6 all the way through chapter 19. We see God's judgment upon the whole earth. Yet in Revelation 3.10, God tells the faithful church at Philadelphia that because they're faithful, that they will be terio ek, they will be taken out, they will be um, removed from this, the path of danger or the freight train that's coming their way. How does that happen? How does that work? So by implication, rapture is there. Um, by implication, it's here because as in the days of Noah, yes, it's going to be wicked and so forth, but those days um, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. So they were unaware, it says here. They were unaware, so it was life as usual. And then what happened? Then the flood came and swept them away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Notice he's talking about a coming that is before judgment. What good is it providing Noah and his family an ark after the flood, the waters receding? Oh, here, Noah. Here's an ark. No, it's before judgment. Um, so, you know, some people will have to go, ha, ha, ha. So you're saying there's two second comings. Well, no, I'm saying there's two comings. Um, I'm not calling them both a second coming. Um, you know, one, one trick is to take a quick look, do a search in the Bible and find the phrase second coming. So the difference is, is that we meet the Lord in the air. This is what we are told in First Thessalonians. And Jesus also gave Hebrew wedding tradition language in John 14. We have the bridegroom coming for his bride, and the tradition is called the taking. And he does not come all the way to her house. Instead, he meets her part way. He meets her part way. He meets her at the gate, and the two parties merge, and then they go to the father's house. The doors are shut for seven days, a week of celebration, feasting, and so forth. So that's the language that we have here. The second coming, we call it the second coming. It's just like Ezekiel 38 and 39, we call the Gog and Magog War. The Bible never calls it the Gog and the Gog War. Um, Ezekiel never says, now let me tell you about the Gog and Magog War. These are things that we name it, we call it. So this event where Jesus returns that we see prophesied in the Old Testament, and that actually happens in Revelation 19, where Jesus comes back to the earth. And we know also from uh, Zechariah that his, he comes back and his foot touches down on uh, the Mount of Olives and it splits and water pours forth and so forth. And we call all that the second coming uh, or the second advent. 
but there's nothing to say that there's not a kind of partial coming, like it says in John 14. There's nothing saying that that doesn't happen. John 14 must happen because Jesus said it would happen. First Thessalonians 4 must happen where we meet the Lord in the air. Revelation 19, we don't meet the Lord in the air. Some people will try to say, well, we do. Jesus comes back, we meet him in the air, and boom, we come right back down. <whistles> kind of a thing. Okay. There are problems with that, and um, I've addressed those formerly. But if you meet the Lord in the air, and 1 Corinthians 15 happens, and we are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Um, so we meet the Lord in the air, we come down, we have glorified bodies. It means all believers get glorified bodies at that time. The, that means there are no mortal believers left. If there's no mortal believers left, then all the sheep, all the lambs, and the sheep and the goats um, trial that we read about and we read about in Matthew 25 um, are all immortal. And if all are immortal, who goes into the kingdom as the mortals? Who are Who's ruled with a rod of iron? Who um, does Satan recruit after the thousand years when he gathers up armies together against Jerusalem, against the saints, and against Jesus in, in Jerusalem? Who does that, who, how does that work? Because we know the mortals have to go in and have babies and so forth, and babies will grow up, and after a thousand years, you're going to have billions of babies um, who have been born, because people aren't dying, and as you so you're going to have a bunch of people who are not believers that Satan's going to be, even if it's not billions, but even if it's millions and millions, that Satan is going to be able to round up and recruit to go up against Jerusalem and all the saints there and Jesus there that get put down at a moment, at a word. That can't happen if you have a post-tribulation type of a thing. So there are a couple of events, a couple of things that happen that show you that these by implication, are two different events. And that's one of the things that we see that implies it's two different events. But here's another thing that happens, okay? Sorry, here we go. I changed it. Now we've got uh, the Greek interlinear, okay? Um, so it's, in the English, very often we'll say then, two men will be in a field. One will be taken, one's left. Let's take a look here. See, we got then... Two men will be in a field. So it's not um, necessarily the next event. Um, again, we, we use context to determine the meaning, but we also use the original languages too. So then two men will be in a field, one will be taken, one left. Okay. Again, at that time, at that time, two men will be in the field, one will be taken. And another left. Two women will be taken. Taken to one side. Taken to receive to oneself. Parlambano. To take to oneself. To receive a charge of, of possession. To receive a, a matter of instruction or to receive. So you're receiving it to be uh, or, or to be carried off. Like it says here, to be carried off is another thing. But to take to oneself, to take aside. So a lot of people will try to say, no, see, they're taken in they're taken in judgment. They're taken away in judgment. No, this is this is to receive to oneself. So it's not that kind of a language, paralambano. So by implication, two men in the field, one taken and one's left. Um, by implication, if you have one taken and one's left, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at another way, but this is to take to your to take to oneself. And that's kind of a, a different kind of a language. So what I want to point out here in this passage is that one's taken and one's left. Okay. Now bear with me here. Now go flip over to chapter 25. And you got the parable of the ten virgins. Keep going. You got the parable of the talents. Then you got the final judgment. Um, when the Son of Man comes, let's start with verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Um, now, 
I want to point out a couple of things here. People will say at the last trump, Jesus is coming at the last trump. It's the last trumpet. Okay, Revelation 19, there's no trumpet. And we've got all the angels coming back. When you've got Jesus coming back, um, in the other description, it's that with the sound of a trump and the voice of an archangel. This isn't an archangel and this isn't trumpets. Now we've got the actual, actual second coming. There's no trumpet here. And you've got all the angels with him. Um, before him will be gathered all the nations. So his glorious throne. Now notice at least one of his thrones or he creates a throne comes down to earth because he comes back and he's sitting on his throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd sep as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. That's why this is the sheep and goats judgment. And he'll place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then what happens? Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Um, so I just want to put this for context here. This is the actual second coming here. This isn't a rapture passage, okay? But but I want you to notice something that most people look over, okay? Before him were gathered all the nations. I thought one taken and one left. So this one here, we got everybody gathered, okay? Um as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So the former was Matthew 24, one taken, one left. This one here, we've got all the nations gathered, sheep and goats. So we've got two different events. So what's implied here? There's no overt rapture in Matthew 24, in the Olivet Discourse, whatever. Here's the second coming. After, at the second coming, all the nations are gathered. Everybody who's still alive are gathered, and they're separated, sheep from goats. So what was that in Matthew 24? Matthew 24, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, day and hour. You can know the season, but you can't know the day and the hour. Not even the angels of heaven nor the sun. Some when he came in the first time, he came. Um, he's 100% God, but he's also 100% man. So um, the only things he knew were the things the Father imparted to him until he resurrected and then he ascended. Now he's back on his throne and he's in his former state. Everything's restored back to, to the way it was beginning. So now he knows. Okay. Anyway, for as in those uh, days... Before the flood, they were eating and drinking. And then Noah entered the ark. Okay, so we're talking about events before the flood, before judgment. Before judgment. And then what happens before judgment? Then, or at that time, as we saw in the Greek, okay, the word means at that time, as we saw in the Greek. Again, do I need to go back and look at it? I can. Um, at that time, before the flood, two men are in a field, one's taken, one's left. So what are we saying? Are we saying judgment's coming on the earth, but those who are going to be judged are taken out of the earth? They're taken in judgment, and the the saints are left behind to endure the wrath and to endure the judgment, to endure the flood? Doesn't really fit the context, does it? So is the rapture here or is it not? So who's left? So we're talking about judgment coming upon the earth. That's the context, as in the days, as were the days of Noah. And life is going on as usual. Noah enters the ark. What happened when Noah entered the ark? 
and then the Lord shuts the door and there's judgment. And it's telling us it's before. That's the wording that's used here, right? As in those days before the flood, it's he's talking about that's the context. He's talking about those days before the flood, before the judgment of God upon the earth. That's what I mean by implied in the subtext. And people will look at this. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures gather. We read about the vultures gathering, the, the carrion birds. We read about that in, in um, Revelation 19, right? We're having our marriage supper of the Lamb, but there's another supper that's going on. It's described in Revelation 19. So there we got, here we've got uh, lightning from the east shines in the, as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, and and uh, look, there he is. Don't believe it. False prophets, false Christs and things. He's talking about all the things that are, that, um, are what it's going to be like. Look, he's in the wilderness or so far. So here we're in the judgment here. These types of events are really going to be ramped up at that time because we have the false prophet, the false Christ. And some people will look at this, wherever the corpse is, the vultures will gather. Okay. So in the context of the things he's talking about here, are you saying that there are vultures gathered in heaven? So he's taking people away in judgment and taking them up to feed them to the vultures in heaven? Or are you saying the ones left behind? Are you saying the ones left behind, one is taken and one's left, ones that are left are the saints, and the saints are going to be left behind for the vultures? So we've got two different events here, and you have to look through and parse this and do it yourself. But the big thing that I would look, that I would look at is, is the days of Noah, and he's talking about in context before the flood. But then again, um, two is he's talking about one taken and one left. So also to show that this has got to be about rapture here in the context is when you get to the time of the second coming, we've already had the seal judgments is bad. One fourth of the world destroyed. Then you've got the trumpet judgments. Another one-third of the world destroyed. And it's going to be so bad in the bowl judgments. I don't believe it tells us at all even what, that, what it is. But if, you know, if, if the math keeps working that way, then you know, maybe it's another two-thirds or maybe it's another half the world that's wiped out um, of what's left. I don't know. But it's, it, it ramps up and it ticks up as far as intensity and, and destruction. So by the time we get to the bowls, you know, we've had a hundred pound hail falling on the earth, um, cometary matter falling upon the earth and asteroids, volcanoes going off, wormwood poisoning of the water. We've, we've had uh, uh, Babylon, the Babylonian system of mystery, Babylon destroyed. We've had persecution of the Antichrist, um, ba really the beast, uh, uh, Antichrist possessed by Satan. So now the beast persecuting people. So slaughter all over the world. We've, we've got Armageddon, all the nations gathered in to uh, one place. And we've got the, the, the war of uh, Armageddon all staged and ready to pop off. Um, we've got all the water, all the water by this time turning to blood. We've, we've had a CME, coronal mass ejection, hit the earth and scorched man where everybody's cursing. And burns people, and now you've got darkness upon the earth, and the moon has turned to blood, all this stuff going on. And you got two men working in a field? Really? Who's going to be going to work? No one's going to be going to work. You couldn't get people to go to work when people were having to mask, and, and, but you're going to have a whole world turn to blood, and the CMEs hit the earth, and people are going to work. Two men are working in a field. One's taken, and one's left. Two women grinding at the mill. You got women grinding at the mill, going to work? At the second coming? Everybody's going to be ducking and hiding and covering at the second coming. It's going to be awful. 
Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, the master had left his house and had known in what part of the night the thief was coming. He would have stayed awake. He would not have left his, let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Um, the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So if this is about second coming, you're not expecting, by this time, you're not expecting the second coming. If this is a second coming passage, all this stuff going off on the earth and Armageddon's going on and uh, uh, the moon's turned to blood and the sun's turned black and there's this been a CME and all this stuff's going on and and you're not expecting the, the, the second coming? Really? And he's coming like a thief? Well, when does a thief burn down the house first and you know, hit it with a wrecking ball and all the fireworks and, and uh, you know, the asteroids falling and comets falling and all these things happening and, and sending somebody to go and assault people, basically with the beast. You're not expecting the coming of the Son of Man? Why is he saying it's going to become like a, like a thief? Like you're not expecting it. No, because the context is, again is the days of Noah, and it's before, okay? For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days of Noah, those days before the flood, before the flood. That's the context. So, in this passage, or I guess, way my camera's set right now, that's second coming. That's not the rapture. I'm just saying that both are in here. But what means one thing for, for one group means something else for another group. Because the Jews are going into this time, into this period. This is the time of Jacob's or Israel's trouble. And, but of course, Jews who are saved, like the Ten virgins, you had five foolish and five wise. The virgins are Israel. Some go in and some don't. Some are saved, even as now, and some are not. So, I'm just saying, think about it, pray about it, reread the passage, ask questions below. And I know this is going to be a big, wait a minute. What is this guy saying? Is this guy crazy? I'm crazy. So, you know, I am crazy, but pray about it and consider it and think about it and see, because second coming is not very thief-like um, for those who are going through it. We, that which is precious, the bride of Christ as the salt and light on the earth, taken out of the world, we are that which is stolen. The thief comes and steals, steals us. We are the bride of Christ. That is the taking in the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition. The bridegroom comes like a thief and he takes the bride to the father's house and they have their celebration. This, it's all over but the shouting. In fact, the shouting's already happened too by the archangel or by all the angels. Um, so these are all things to consider. Write down some of the things I said, you know, don't have in the in the past Matthew 25 passage in, in Revelation 19 you don't have an angel you don't have trumpet but you do in rapture passages you have an archangel and you've got a, uh, a trumpet a shofar so you got all these differences here before the before the flood as the passages here I have highlighted a little phrase right there and thief like you hear you got one taken one left second coming in Matthew 25 you got to, everybody's gathered at that point, not just one taken and one left. Because if, if they're both talking about the same passage, the ones that are left, how do they get to the sheep and goats judgment if they're all gathered? You can't say, well, they gathered the first batch for judgment this time, okay, in Matthew 24, and then they go and get the saints for their other half. And then, so they're talking about both, but they just only mentioned the first. How, how do they... You got one taken and one's left, and then um, 
the ones that are left, how do they get to the Valley of Decision? Maybe there's a airplane and they have a shuttle and everybody can jump on board or something or maybe the space shuttle comes or whatever. I don't know what happens. How, how would that happen? you got two different events to talk, it's speaking of here. So um, think about it, pray about it, um, and, and um, let me know your thoughts. You know, I, I know a bunch of you are going to think I'm crazy and I don't know what I'm talking about. But is this compelling? Is it not compelling? If there's a the part that you say that I haven't dealt with adequately and you think, it's no, that's wrong because this, then mention it and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to catch it and I'll try to respond to it. Um, I might respond to it in, in the text in the, within the comments underneath your comment below, but I also it might call for a follow-up video. But I'm just giving you some things to think about and pray about. Interesting stuff to think about. Okay? And... Dig into the Word. This is what I'm trying to encourage here is dig into the Word. Prove me wrong. Do the work. Do the hard work. Don't just say, you're wrong, you're a moron, you don't know what you're talking about, and then sign off and leave. If you think I'm wrong, give me the chapter and verse where I'm wrong and how I have it wrong. If you have another way you think things play out, say, no, Jesus returns at the second coming. There's no rapture. There's no rapture till the at the end of the tribulation. And then sign off and no, give me a verse. It's not 2 Thessalonians 2. That's a second coming passage. I mean, we know by the context, because he mentions what happens before that, is you're going to have Antichrist stuff going on. The man of sin standing in the temple and declaring himself to be God. We know that's the middle of the week. Daniel 9.27. So that's a second coming passage. So don't point to 2 Thessalonians 2 and try to tell me that's a rapture passage because it is not. That's a second coming passage by the context because he references Daniel 9.27. Daniel 9.27 is the middle of the week. In the middle of the week. And it's the tribulation week. So, but give me verses. Don't just tell me I'm a dummy and I don't know what I'm talking about and how I'm a false teacher. I'm going to hell. Um, give, give me some Bible verses and show me. And don't give me something really obscure from the Old Testament that um, from a part of a psalm that isn't even about <laughs> the rapture or anything and, and try to give me one little phrase and say, see, context. Look, you can give me that and you can point that to me, but you got to tell me, explain to me what's on your mind and how you are thinking that that is part of in the context of a rapture, in the context of the tribulation, not just some little snippet of a phrase from somewhere. Um, that's not how it's done. Okay? So anyway, hope this prompts you to think and to pray and to dig into the Word. Dig into the Word and, um, and be blessed. All right?